came back there or when we came out, who's going to do announcements? And they said, uh. So, <laughs> good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning. Um, we have uh, just a few announcements. Uh, we're doing a couple of collections right now. Um, one is for um, toiletries and stuff that they can put in bags and give out to um, homeless. Uh, when is that? June 12th? June 12th, and um, so if you can bring stuff like um, deodorant and toothpaste and toothbrush and uh, stuff like that, um, Renee's taking that up. And then in the back, there's a couple of uh, boxes. We're doing a food drive for a local family and um, doing that through next week. Is that correct? You say two weeks. Okay, so through next week, by next Sunday night, make sure you bring it. But please make sure that everything you bring is in date and make sure that you're not just going through your cabinet and finding all the stuff you don't like and bringing it. Um, <laughs> Pastor said Wednesday night, if you wouldn't feed it to your, your family, then don't give it to this. You know, make sure it's, um, you know, we don't want them to just get 100 cans of peas or something. <laughs> so, uh, Women in Faith will be meeting on June 1st at 6 o'clock at the Fellowship Building. We're gonna have, um, we're, we've been offered a dish of baked spaghetti for us, and so we're gonna bring stuff to go with that, for salad and bread and desserts and things like that. Got a really good lesson planned for that night. And we're also gonna work on packing those bags for um, the thing on June 12th. Um, um, I don't, do you know how many children the family has? Any other announcements? Okay, this will be our offertory hand. Page 508, or you can read where you can see the first, second. <coughs>
Well, I've got two numbers I've got to do uh, that are requested, but the Holton family, and then uh, of course my wife's got one she wants me to do, so I hope they'll be a blessing to all of them. Last me. 
Joseph fits in that plan. You know, it's interesting to me that God doesn't always choose the most likely to succeed. You would think he would choose the oldest brother. He chooses number 11. Why well, number 11? But God has a plan. <clears throat> I'm going to be looking at Genesis chapter 50 and several chapters around that this morning as we study about the direction that God leads Joseph as he builds his nation. 1914, Mahatma Gandhi returned to India helped fight uh, for independence. By 1920, he was elected the ruler, <clears throat> or the leader of home rule. And by 1947, India had its freedom. The reason they gained independence is because the people bought into the leadership of Gandhi. That's exactly what happened in the time of Joseph. The people were struggling. <clears throat> it was a difficult time. And Joseph came to the forefront as a leader, <clears throat> and the people bought into that leadership. But it was a path. There are several pieces to this puzzle that God put together. And it's always interesting how God puts your life together. Sometimes when it's broken, how he puts it back together. But it's so interesting how he put this puzzle together in the life of Joseph. Out of betrayal, we're going to see God give Joseph strength. And in the middle of pain, sometimes we wonder how in the world God's going to use this. And how anything good is going to come out of that situation. We realize that from the story this morning, Ted told it, that uh, he was sold into slavery. And you wonder how can anything good come out of being sold into slavery? But trouble had been brewing in that family for a long time. There were 12 children and Joseph was the favorite. <clears throat> Jacob made no bones about it. And there was no doubt that Jacob or Israel loved Joseph more than the, he loved the other brothers. Yes. Let me ask you this morning, were you the favorite child when you were growing up? Yeah. Uh, uh, the other children were always the favorite child. But let me tell you, if, <clears throat> if you're the only child and you're still not the favorite, there, there's trouble in your house. <laughs> or, or if there are two children in your house and <coughs> your mom and dad can't remember your name, you're probably not the favorite child right. in that particular yeah. family. <clears throat> Parents try not to show favoritism to their children most of the time. But again, Joseph, uh, Jacob made no bones about it. He gave J uh, Joseph the best of everything. And so his brothers decided when they had an opportunity to get rid of him, they sold him to a group going to Egypt. They even got enough money out of it to go by McDonald's and have a meal together. They enjoyed that. 
They went back and told their father that, uh, that he had died. That he had been torn apart by, by animals. You know something interesting? He was torn apart, but the coat wasn't. The coat was whole. Right. And if an animal tore somebody apart, he'd probably tear the coat up too. But Jacob decided his son was dead, and it said he mourned. There are difficult times in our life. It's like the <clears throat> lady went to Europe, and she called back home to her husband and said, well, how is my dog doing? And he said, well, I'm sorry your dog died. She said, that is so insensitive. You ought to be a little more sensitive. And he said, what should have I said? And she, he said, well, you should have said, that, well, the dog climbed out on the roof, and it was raining, and the roof was slick, and he slid off the roof and fell and, and hit the ground and died. And he said, okay. And she said, well, how's my mother doing? He said, well, your mother climbed out on the roof and it was raining. <laughs> Sometimes we're not very sensitive when one person dies, but Jacob's heart was broken. There was a great deal of remorse. Now I want you to think about this this morning. <clears throat> if you were to take a 17-year-old and you drop him in the middle of China, they couldn't speak any Chinese, they didn't know anybody, they didn't know exactly what they were going to do, and yet they had to exist. That's exactly what happened to Joseph. They dropped him in the middle of a situation where he didn't know the language, he didn't know the people, didn't know exactly what was going to happen. But God gave him strength. That's part of the puzzle. He went on to give him integrity out of temptation. When Joseph got to Egypt, <clears throat> they sold him as a slave. Now for 17 years, he had been the apple of his daddy's eye. And all of a sudden, he was a slave. He was at the bottom of the barrel. But again, God uses this situation because he puts him in the house of a man named Potiphar. He's a very wealthy and powerful man. And he's there in that house, and, and, and he begins to see the strength of this young man. It's a powerful thing for, for people to see what God has put in your life. Yes, it's a powerful thing to, to see what Potiphar saw in this young man. And the great strength that he saw there, the leadership ability. But sometimes God uses people. You know, I had a teacher in college that came from Pakistan, learned English, and got a PhD at the same time. Now, that's a smart person. And you recognize that in, in a person like that. And he recognized <clears throat> what was in Joseph's life. So again, think about this. An 18 or a 19-year-old, he puts him in charge of everything in his house. That's like putting a teenager in charge of the West Wing in the White House. It is absolutely amazing what God was doing in his life. Yeah. Potiphar noticed him, but so did Potiphar's wife. It, it said in, in one of the translations that Joseph was well-built and handsome. Now, guys, this morning, that's a burden we have to bear sometime, isn't it? <laughs> that we're well-built and handsome. <laughs> but it was absolutely true of Joseph. Amen. And he caught the eye of Potiphar's wife. Yeah. And she continued to invite him to be a part of her life. And, and you think this morning, what difference does it make? He was a long way from home. Nobody from his family would ever know about this. And he was in the midst of a lot of trouble. Why couldn't he enjoy some things? I'm going to tell you something this morning that's absolutely true. Temptation always looks good. You're right. Amen. It always looks good. Yes, sir. But the consequences never end. That's right. It was easy to fall <laughs> all kinds of temptation. Like a lady that was in a weight loss support group. And she went to her meeting that day and she said to, to the folks, I, I baked a cake yesterday and a uh, day before yesterday and my family ate half of it. And I came in the next morning and, and I thought, well, one little piece won't hurt. And she said, before I was finished, I ate the rest of that half a cake. And they said, well, what'd your husband say? He didn't find out. Because <clears throat> I baked another cake, ate half of it, and made it look like the original cake. <clears throat> <laughs> Some of those situations we say, well, come on, who, who's going to know the difference? Joseph said, God's going to know the difference. That's right. Amen. He said, I can't sin against Potiphar, you're his wife, and I can't sin against God. You know, a lot of times people will say it doesn't matter what a leader does in their private life as long as they lead in the right way in their public life. That's not true. They might. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you today, people who are leaders need to be people of integrity. Yes. Potiphar found out, you remember what he did? Threw Joseph in prison for doing the right thing. 
Now, his wife said, uh, he tried to force himself on me and, and I grabbed his coat and, and I tore his coat off and, and he, he ran out. There's a Puritan preacher one day that said, Joseph lost his coat that day, but he kept his character. Amen. You see, God is, is building not only strength in him, but he's also building in integrity. Know something again this morning. The message is always filtered through the messenger. Why do a lot of people buy a certain kind of tennis shoe, basketball shoe? Because Michael Jordan said it was good. And that's the only reason they'll pay $100 for that particular shoe. So it is important that leaders live with integrity because the message is going to flow through those leaders. And then God's going to take another piece of the puzzle. Out of hardship, he's going to give Joseph wisdom. Now again, think about this. For doing the right thing, Joseph is sitting in a dark, dusty, smelly dungeon, wondering what happened. You ever get to a point, like you said this morning, you ever get to the point where you think, God, what's going on? Well, what's going on in my life? I feel like I'm, I'm doing the right thing, and it seems like everything is falling apart. That you get to a situation where, where your life is stretched and, and your faith is pushed to the limit. And all of a sudden you look back on that situation and realize God taught you all kinds of things in that situation. And God's going to give Joseph wisdom in this time and leadership skills and administrative skills. It's going to be amazing how God's going to put everything together. Because in that same prison there were two other guys. The cupbearer and the baker of Pharaoh. Now you can imagine these three guys sitting around like the movie Old Brother Way Out There singing We're Men of Many Sorrows because they had a lot of sorrows. They got to be friends and they started talking. And they said, Joseph, I, the cup bears I had a dream. And Joseph interpreted that dream and said, now listen, you're going to be put back in power. And the baker said, that sounds good to me. And he said, you're not going to make it. It's bad news to you, but you're not going to make it. And all of a sudden, exactly what he said happened. He interpreted those dreams in the right way. The cup barrel was returned to the king. And the last thing, the last thing they talked about, Joseph said to the cup bearer, now remember me. When you get back in your power, position of power, remember me. Chapter 40, verse 33, 23 says, the chief cup bearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot it. You ever felt like in your life you turned a corner when you turned a corner and you ran into another wall? Yeah. Ever wondered what was happening into your life? And it said two years passed. Now, at 70, looking back two years doesn't seem like a long time. But if you've ever been in a situation where you're in some kind of prison, where pain, difficulty, or family troubles, or the list could go on, two years is a long, long time. He sat in that dark prison for two more years. But God continued to fill him with wisdom and patience. Then he was going to add another aspect to his leadership ability as God called him. And out of power, he was going to teach Joseph how to forgive. One day the cup bearer didn't remember. He told Pharaoh this man could interpret his dreams. And, and again, you remember the story. There were going to be seven good years and then seven lean years. And Joseph said, you need to find somebody that can lead during those lean years. And he said, Joseph, there's no better person in this whole world than you. God just prepared him for that moment. Now, we often hear of a person who's second in command going to prison. But we rarely ever hear of anybody going from prison to second in command. Right. You know, that's got to be a God thing when you think about it. God's putting all those things together. He'd gone from the top to the bottom, and now he's going from the bottom to the top again. And he could do anything he wanted to do. He had the power to do anything he wanted to do. And all of a sudden, who should show up but his brothers? God brought those brothers right into his presence. And you know as well as I do, he had the power to crush them, and nobody would have ever questioned him. He had the power to put them in prison, and nobody would have ever said anything to him. But I'm going to tell you as a leader, I've learned one thing. You can never be God's leader. You can never be a godly leader without a forgiving spirit. Amen. You can Amen. never do it. Wherever you are, if you're a leader, people are going to run you down sometimes. They're going to hurt you. They're going to discourage you. And the list goes on and on. 
And if you harbor all those feelings, you will never be able to lead as God wants you to lead. You've got to have that, that forgiving spirit. That's right. You're going to drag a lot of baggage around with you. You know, I've seen political leaders who had their hate list and it absolutely destroyed them. Joseph could have lived in the past, dwelt on what his brothers had done to us, the injustice he had suffered. But I love to read this story because in this moment we see Joseph take off those prison clothes of bondage. Yes, amen. And God sets him free. Sets him free to do what God has called him to do. He'd worked through a long process, but in this process you're going to hear the confession of his brothers. Only through forgiveness could that family be brought back together again. And in the midst of that story, I want you to notice something sometimes we overlook. At one time, Joseph wanted to keep Benjamin and keep him with them. And his brother Judah steps up and says, let me take Benjamin's place. You flip all the way over to the New Testament. And all of a sudden, a man from the tribe of Judah named Jesus yes. takes our place. That's right. God was getting the message ready hundreds of years before it happened. God had a plan that reached all the way to the cross at Calvary. In this part of the story, God teaches us there's got to be forgiveness. And out of pain, God shows us He still had a plan. God takes all these broken pieces. I'll tell you something this morning. Sometimes God will allow the world to break us apart so He can put us together the way He wants us to be put together. For 17 years, God had prepared the soul while He was with His family. For 13 years, God was planting the seeds. And for 70 years, God would use what he planted in that soul. God was going to use him in leadership growth. We were able to see God's big plan, how God prepared him and how God put all these things together. Do you know when their father died, the brothers were afraid that he was going to retaliate. But he says to the brothers in chapter 50, verse 20, you intended this for harm, but God intended it for good. Had God not put Joseph in that place, that family would have been destroyed in starvation. Right. And there would have been no nation of Israel. But God had a plan. Right. And God had a story. And we can see God working through those, all those things to make it possible. Sometimes there are a series of storms in our life and a number of battles, but then the sun comes out. The darkness of the cross on Friday and then the sunshine and the celebration of power on Sunday morning. God tells us that we've got to follow Him. Now sometimes we don't understand things. You ever got that point in your life you just don't understand what's going on? We've got to be guided by faith, not by sight. Right. Trust, not by explanation. God took that and put it together and used Joseph in that opportunity. And I've seen that happen in the church over and over again. <clears throat> I stood with people by the graves of their children. And there's a terrible thing to, to bury your child. But I've also watched through the years those same parents go minister to other people who've lost children. It's a powerful moment because they understand. I've seen people who struggle as young people grow up to be used by God to help other young people who have struggled. I've watched single parents who have fought battle after battle to help other single parents who are struggling through difficulty. People who have gone through times of addiction in their life go to help other people who, who are struggling through those same demons. Things often Satan uses that he thinks he's going to destroy us with, God takes those things and turns them around. And we get to see the power and the glory of an almighty God change yes. the life. Amen. People would see the great leadership skills of Joseph, but let me tell you something more important. They would see the great power of an almighty God. Right. You know, in Egypt at that particular time, they worshiped over 2,000 different gods. And yet the God of Joseph would rise above them all. Amen. Everybody would be able to see the power of the God of Joseph. In our time of famine in life or crisis or times of struggle, we need leaders in our churches who will honor God and walk with God. Dr. Martin Luther uh, Lloyd-Jones said, it's tragic when a person succeeds before they're ready for it. 
Joseph was ready for it because God prepared him. Proverbs 19, 21, it says, Many are the plans of man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. You see, it was the Lord's purpose through the life of Joseph that prevailed. When he was ready to be a leader, God had put together a man who had experienced so many things. But he was a man of strength and integrity and wisdom and a sense of forgiveness. And he was ready not only to follow God, but to be a leader for God. There was a man named Hart Fable. <clears throat> he was a great leader in his church. He helped his church grow in every way it could grow. He was a leader who would accept a challenge when there was a new job in the church. And the thing that was so interesting about Art was that he had a great deal of enthusiasm and a great deal of stamina in following the Lord. And what was so unique about Art was he was 90 years old, but he didn't give up because he felt like God could still use him as a leader in his church. He had hope for the future. We're in the middle of a lot of junk on in our world today. A whole lot of stuff that, that's going on. And God is calling, and he's calling, in a, in a, I think in a loud voice today, he's calling for leaders in the church that will tell this world there is still hope because God's still got a plan. It's God's got a story, and he wants us to be a part of that story. This morning as we sing our hymn of invitation, we offer that opportunity to you <coughs> to stand before the Lord and say, God, just use us. Use us this morning like you used Joseph. To help a world that's starving and spiritual this morning. Let's sing again. <clears throat> Let's stand as we sing. dedicate ourselves to share the story. You bow your heads and you pray for this church. 
and you pray for this community. We're going to give you an opportunity as Miss Brenda plays. All you've asked us to do is come just as we are. Just like Joseph, he wasn't prepared, but uh, God, you became his teacher. You became his leader. And you put everything in him that needed to be there. Father, as we continue your story tonight, we pray God will come back and, and that we'll learn more about you, that we'll be drawn closer to you and have a greater desire to bring renewal to this church and revival to the community. Again, thank you for today. Thank you for your wonderful story.